Well, it's been a slow news week. I know you all know. This past Monday, uh, we saw the Air Force uh, and its proposal to move to, into the future with its fiscal year 21 budget. And before we launch into that topic, I'd like to spotlight, take a minute to spotlight the work of Spotlight the work of Mitchell's own Mark Gunzinger and Carl Rayberg. Uh, late last year, they uh, wrote the Moving Toward the Air Force We Need, Assessing Air Force Budget Trends. I uh, encourage you to uh, take a look at that, either pick it up on your way out or online. And it's a discussion that centers on the pass-through and how that's affected uh, the representation of uh, equity among the resourcing across the services. Uh, and I just want to publicly recognize the great work Mark and uh, Carl did on that. As for this morning, the themes are clear in the Air Force's 2021 20, budget. It reflects the approach to preparing our Air Force for the future. And underpinning that strategy is the clear statement that the nation's asking the Air Force to do more than it can do. Uh, well, we have the privilege of having the leader who's at the leading edge of what the nation is asking. And uh, welcome to Lieutenant General Mark Kelly, who's the Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations at the Headquarters Air Force. And in support of the uh, Chief and the Secretary, uh, General uh, Kelly leads the development and implementation of policy directly supporting global operations, force management, training readiness across airspace and cyber. And by the way, my favorite especially dear to me, also Air Force weather. Um, he determines for the Joint Staff, of course, in his role as Air Force Operations Deputy, um, operational requirements, capabilities, and training required to support national security, defense, and military objectives. We all know Grace Kelly as uh, a great commander. Uh, he's uh, commanded two numbered Air Forces, uh, an expeditionary wing, wing back in the States here. He is a war fighter not to be challenged and a friend to us all. And so without a, a further elaboration, I welcome Lieutenant General Mark Kelly. It's Thanks, sir. Yours. Thanks. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm going to steal this back from Stutz right there. No, that's OK. That's all right. I can, I can do it without notes. <laughs> Uh, but I'd probably be misquoted, and as you know, folks know, my wife tells me I need no help sounding stupid. Um, but it'd be misquoted to be it. So first of all, again, welcome and thanks for everyone's time. Uh, the the chat I'm going to have with you guys is really just to stimulate questions and discussion. It's 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 and it's all scoped down. Uh, John Depp will ask for a specific topic, so I'm going to give him a specific topic. And so it's aviation centric, but obviously that doesn't take away from how important. The uh, JADC2, the cyber and the space equities are to our Air Force. I'm happy to have a discussion on that. It's just not in the narrative that John Deptula had requested. The other thing, probably the biggest foot stomper for today, is it's unconstrained by budget realities. And so our budget, which again was referenced, you know, the proposal that rolled out on Monday, it is constrained by budget realities. And it reflects those difficult choices that our nation's leaders have to make. And so again, uh, just to start off with that. The other one is we get to Q&A. Uh, I have the pleasure every day of not being the A8 or the FM. Uh, so I will guarantee you uh, there is individual and guarantee collective more knowledge of the budget than I have up here. But I'm happy to defer any questions to the A8 and I'll take them back to him. <laughs> so uh, this is what I'm going to talk about is a, is a hopefully not a rambling, but it will meander kind of back and forth a little bit from uh, snapping the chalk line of what our Air Force and nation was in 1990, and a little bit of what uh, we deal with every day uh, when we wake up and make the commute into the Pentagon. And, and you'll get a little bit of sense of just how those dynamic, dynamics uh, affect some of the decisions and some of the capabilities that we have or don't have uh, to do our nation's bidding. So with that, so this is the stuff I'll chat about real quick. And that is, uh, we've been on a readiness recovery. It's pretty well documented. We've talked about it at different AFA ses uh, sessions. A uh, lot of good energy, a lot of good effort, a lot of good support from Congress, uh, and a lot of good guidance from the top for our readiness recovery. Um, what I'm going to go there from there is I'm going to kind of compare and contrast a little bit of what I call the divergence of Air Force capacity 
not to be confused with capability, Air Force capacity in our operations tempo that we've worked with over the last three decades. You know, this is an important year as we mark August of 2020 being the 30 year mark of when we went to the desert. And frankly, your Air Force went there and never left. And so it has, a, it has an impact, as you'd expect, to what we do day in and day out. Some adversary uh, lessons, and I would call public perceptions, and of course we're part of that public, so we are included in those perceptions from the coverage of Desert Storm and then the writings and the lessons, whether they be scholarly, whether they be in the blog of, of what came out of Desert Storm. A little bit back to today, national defense strategy and great power competition, and what that actually means day to day to those folks that are in the field and the combat frontier and those folks that are back here supporting them in the uh, Pentagon. And a little bit of what the uh, peer adversary fight requirements uh, would, would, would entail and a little bit of way ahead. Again, the way ahead, I will reiterate, is a little budget unconstrained, which you might say, well, that means it's not realistic and that's not an unfair characteristic. And so again, it's just an academic uh, discussion that we can deviate from. So, as far as our readiness recovery goes, we were given unambiguous guidance uh, in April of 2018 of what we needed to do. And frankly, we had a force that for 17 years had been in the Middle East, uh, and we put a lot of miles on our airmen mostly, our equipment, uh, our aircraft, and our families, which are the least paid members of this Air Force team. And that obviously is a bill we have to address and take care of. So the readiness recovery, as it kind of states up there, we injected, with the help of Congress, a whole lot of time, energy, and funding to get at the equipment, the training, the training ranges, the uh, sustainment legs that we have. And the sustainment enterprise, frankly, is a monster and probably least understood by the, the entirety of our service and nation to get at an increased readiness. And so this, the chalk line that I reference here is October 2019. We'd, increase the overall readiness 16% across the Air Force. And then we have lead pacing units. They'll be the first out the door and the first to fight. If you would, we increase those. We focus more energy and resource to them. Head up their readiness by 35%. And we continue uh, working on this day in and day out. But as the, as the bottom line, I'll tell you, and this crowd knows well, it's challenging, if not downright impossible, to take a unit this deployed forward doing great work for the nation in the Middle East uh, for the CENTCOM commander. It's impossible for me to have them doing that work uh, and also participating in a red flag back in Nels, increasing their readiness. That's just a fact of life that we're, we live in. So this is a little bit of the divergence uh, scribbled on the uh, combat power that we had 30 years ago and that we have now. And so in 1990, uh, frankly, you need to go to the bottom bullet first and because this, this sums it up. Uh, we ended up engaging a regional adversary with a force that was honed and primed and equipped to engage the Soviet Union. I don't think history is going to be kind as to Saddam Hussein. Uh, over his time in history, he chose and the person, and the, or the force he picked to fight at that time in history. We had a very high-tech advantage. Uh, we had a high capacity. I referenced fighter squadrons, but you could take other forces for that matter. You could take cruiser destroyers. You could take marine expeditionary units. You could take, you know, armored brigades, anything you want. Uh, but just gives you an example of ratio. Very high-end training regimen that we have, which means high-end readiness. Usually tied with high-end readiness is high-end retention and high-end morale. Uh, and we had annual training deployments uh, every year to hone that edge to make sure we're ready to go forward and not just do our business out in, say, the Nellis uh, range space. As you go 30 years forward, which a lot of people in this crowd have lived through and worked through, and we actually owe credit to of getting us to 2020, the adversaries out there around the globe, especially our peer adversaries, realize that they're not going to compete unless they close that technology gap. You know, going up uh, against the U.S. in Desert Storm, for example, uh, a, a point of trivia, which is not an unimportant point of trivia, was the average commit range of an F-15C with a U.S. AWACS was 75 miles. And uh, frankly, the, the floggers and the fox bats that the Iraqis were flying were dead when they taxied out. They just didn't know it. That technology gap is closing. Uh, our size of our combat force is, has been reduced. 
Um, the training is episodic, and frankly, all these things over here are tied together. You know, the continual deployments leads to episodic training. Episodic training uh, leads to lower readiness. Lower readiness leads to retention challenges. They're all kind of weaved in together. They're not bad things. They're just things. You know, they're just dynamics that we live and work with, and a lot of folks in here have dealt with. And so as we go forward, what we are charged to do by the National Defense Strategy is we have to prepare a force that's been optimized for a violent extremist fight, uh, now approaching 19 years, uh, to face a peer adversary. So it's just kind of flip a little bit of the dynamic that we have to work through day in and day out. So uh, again, these aren't from scholarly journals. Uh, they're from me. Uh, and so, and of course they're unclassified because they're for this venue. Uh, but if you kind of look through a lot of the writings and a lot of the readings, of what our adversaries pulled out of Desert Storm, they're pretty unambiguous. They're really recurring themes. They're rarely listed in one list that I jammed up here, but they're recurring. Uh, one is that they said, we, we cannot let the U.S. just build a, a loggerhead, a, 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 a mountain of iron that they're gonna then turn and push against us. And so those logistics supply chains uh, that make a force buildup really, really put, our, put an adversary in a bad way. If you fight the U.S. asymmetrically, it usually doesn't end well, and so they can choose to fight us symmetrically or asymmetrically, and you can see through modern day, whether it be a cyber event or a uh, non-attributable event, uh, the things that go on, you know, magically in the middle of the night, UAVs strike, you know, Aramco in Saudi Arabia, or, or, or. However you define asymmetry, you know, we rarely see a force-on-force -force engagement these days. Adversaries learn that if they do not close this technology gap, they will end up paying that bill in, in the battlefield. If they let us have our power projection platforms, and again, a power projection platform could be a carry strike group, it could be an air base, it could be a, a launching point for a armored uh, division. And of course the air domain dominance, I don't say that because I'm an airman, I say that because uh, they learn that if they do not challenge the U.S. air domain dominance, again, there'll be something that they will pay in the fight. And then somewhere along the way they have to break the U.S. kill chain. They don't have to break it five places, they just have to break it one place. And so they focus on every spot they can, whether that be part of our kill chain through space or cyber, or the electromagnetic spectrum there. You know, again, for folks that are students of history, you know, back in World War II, uh, Bernard Law Montgomery, uh, who wasn't really portrayed in the greatest light in the movie Patton, but he was fairly, fairly intelligent character, and he didn't, and history will not be kind to him for Margaret Garden, but that's another story. He was pretty darn smart uh, and pretty big advocate as a soldier for air power. He's the one that was quoted, he had a lot of quotes on air power, but he was the one that quoted if we lose the war in the air, we'll lose the war and we'll lose it quickly. Uh, so I'm gonna to try to take credit for an airman saying if we lose the war in space, we're gonna lose the war and we'll lose it quickly. And that is true. That's one of the reasons why it's such an imperative for the Space Force to get off and going in the right vein. And of course, anything that sits still, anything that sits still in terms of a target, uh, we will generate a GPS address of latitude, longitude, and elevation. Uh, with our ISR uh, out there. And if they can get us to react to an emergent technology, vice the other way around, uh, that's very helpful. And probably our biggest uh, advantage in a fight is our partners and allies. You know, when our adversaries wake up every day, you know, for example, when, a, when Russia wakes up every day and they kind of look to the left and look to the right for their allies that they're going to fight with, they usually get to talk to, you know, Assad or some awesome character like that, um, Maduro. Uh, when we look at our partners and allies, we have the finest war fighters, the finest statesmen, the finest people on the planet. They're very capable of joining with us. Again, my list uh, kind of glommed from, you know, years of kind of eyeballing this and reading, not what we write, reading what comes out of the Mandarin and the Russian uh, documentation, unclassified, what they learned out of that. So I would say uh, the public perception, again, which is we're part of the public, some of the public perceptions, and this is not all inclusive, 
that came out of Desert Storm were, I would say, a little bit nuanced and a little bit different. And they have an effect because public perceptions will eventually make it into the public representatives, which is our great Congress who votes and decides what we will do as a nation, partly defending the nation. And that is our technical advantage is insurmountable and invincible. Uh, and because of our high-end training, because we covered it so well in different documents and documentaries, whether it be a red flag or other exercises out there, um, we just had too far of a, a leap ahead of our adversaries for them to close the training advantage. And that we can strike around the globe with minimal loss of life. We're pretty well defended by patriots. Um, the challenge there is, is Patriot is a very capable weapon system, but it, like any other, has its limitations. And we pretty much have access, basing an overflight needs to execute an air campaign. So I would say, that may be an all-inclusive list, I may have one more. Um, I would say if those items were true in 1990, uh, I would not say they are true today, in 2020. So 2020, though, we do have this thing called National Defense Strategy, which were issued, as it says, in 2018. It gives us fairly unambiguous guidance of what our charge is to do. Again, those reflections from back at Desert Storm and then today are just that. But it, they, we have to look back at history as we go forward. And so these are straight out of the unclassified version of the National Defense Strategy, uh, which basically acknowledges a lot of those bits and pieces I just kind of covered and basically says, uh, like I mentioned before, there is challenges to our advantage. Um, the homeland is no longer a sanctuary. Uh, and we just have to take a different uh, tack, a different view, and a different uh, plan going forward. And of course, we internally have to change the way we organize, train, and present forces. And we've done that, and we're still uh, on that journey. So a little bit of challenge with great power competition. Again, we're, we're doing great power competition with a force optimized for a violent extremist fight over the past you know, 18 years, and that's it. So the other challenge is we expect we'll have a little to zero warning of a crisis, and so whether we'd like to have 30 days, 45 days, 90 days to spin up, move in, do whatever the case may be, we might not have enough unambiguous warning that a crisis is coming, and so we may not be able to spin up very likely have a contested mobilization, a contested transit forward. You know, uh, if a nation state can get into your national elections, it's probably not too much of a stretch to say they can get into Delta Airlines baggage handling. And then the pace of operations that we uh, expect upon arrival into a peer uh, GCC, uh, is going to require a lot of unity command, unity of effort. Bottom line is the folks have to show up ready to fight literally when they step off the airplane. As I lose the battery here. There we go. Bottom line is we have to have high-end readiness levels. Thanks. Okay. So now we get into a peer adversary fight. We hope we don't. We hope we never get into a peer adversary fight. Um, and frankly, uh, I don't usually use the term near peer because I think, frankly, we need to be thinking more like David and less like Goliath. And there's some avenues and lines of effort where, where we are the near and the near peer. Uh, we need to be thinking of these adversaries as peers. So a couple things would happen in a peer adversary fight. And frankly, again, one of the reasons I put up the comparison for discussion with 1990 is very often these things didn't happen uh, in 1990. And that's what's important that causes us pause sometimes when we sit around the table and plan things out. One is uh, the call that didn't happen. Well, first of all, we didn't have a Northcom in 1990. Um, it was stood up after 9-11. But of course, we had NORAD. But the point being is when a fight took place in the Middle East against Saddam Hussein, there was no call from NORAD to raise the air control level to protect the nation and, of course, Canada with NORAD. But Northcom, in a peer fight, General Shaughnessy would ring the Pentagon and talk to John Goldfein and the Joint Staff and the Chairman, and fairly quickly we would have to raise the air control level to protect uh, all the fine taxpayers of this nation. Uh, that requires us pulling from that force I showed you on the right, which is smaller than the force we had in 1990. 
And it's not just a fighter thing, it's an AWACS thing, it's a tanker thing. It's a fairly big uh, commitment. Of course, there's nothing more important than homeland defense, and so you expect it's kind of no-fail business. The next phone call that would come in that didn't come in in 1990 was we're fighting or potentially fighting or posturing to fight a peer adversary, which means by definition they're a nuclear capable adversary. And so STRATCOM would advise us, they wouldn't ask us, they would just advise us that they're going to have to generate uh, the part of the triad, which is our nuclear bomber force, which also requires tankers and of course the bombers, as I, as I mentioned, to be able to provide the government you know, all the options they need to against a, a counter nuclear uh, adversary. Spacecom, I got those out, I apologize, I got those out of order. Spacecom didn't exist, but they would have to reorient the space architecture to make sure we can support the, uh, the supported commander in theater. And STRATCOM, I mentioned that. This did happen. You know, the engaged uh, combatant commander needs the U.S. Air Force to come forward because we're the, we move faster than anything else to be the halt force uh, to protect, protect the region. The challenge with that is, is with our current force capacity, with our current force capacity, I've got a whole bunch more phone calls, or John Goldfein's got a whole bunch more phone calls that are coming in, the Joint Staff's got a whole bunch more phone calls coming in, and after about phone call number four, we're out. It's just factual. And that's with a fairly significant mobilization of our Guard and Reserve. John Clark would make sh call and make sure we have conventional support to his soft effort. Obviously, John Abrams still needs to deter North Korea, he's going to call. And then, of course, John McKenzie still needs to deter Iran as we focus towards a peer adversary. Those are just factual things that will happen. You mean next slide? Thanks. It's a little bit of way ahead. Uh, next. So I'm running out of batteries. So, Again, budget unconstrained. Uh, you, you have to present your adversary with a capability overmatch. That was true in 1990 and that's true today. And so uh, our adversary spent a whole lot of time, energy, money, and angst, and that's good. We wanted them to expend angst. They're trying to counter what we have is a very unique uh, penetrating bomber force, penetrating fighter force, penetrating ISR, penetrating cyber capability. Uh, and we want to make sure that they expend a whole lot of energy doing that uh, every day. And it's not just against a big building uh, that's, you know, the size of uh, a mall. It's against a mobile target and a spectrum denied uh, environment. It's well defended. Next. We're all next. There we go. Capacity hasn't changed. You know, the uh, Secretary Wilson, our, our previous uh, Secretary of the Air Force, uh, rolled out the Air Force we need at the AFA uh, last year. Uh, that hasn't really changed. And that's the, you know, the, the unclassified study of the capacity that our nation's Air Force needs. Um, and that hasn't changed at all. There are other studies that outstrip the classification of this venue. And I'll tell you, they're not much different than this. It's, um, they're amazingly similar. We, we debate on the eaches from the unclassified to the classified studies, but this ends up being, you know, within the ballpark of what we really need to do the missions the nation's asking us to do and to gain readiness at the same time. It's just a varsity game. It's tough to do. Next, which I think is last. And then, uh, yeah, the sustainable piece, the sustainable weapon systems. I tell you, the craftsmen that we have at our nation's depots, and they are your nation's depots, whether it be Tinker or Ogden, you know, Warner Robins, and the component depots and the smaller depots we have out there. They are true craftsmen, and I tell you what, these are national treasures that we have out there, both the facilities and the craftsmen that work in them, and they work miracles every day. You know, for example, at Tinker is where they do, besides the B-1 and AWACS, you know, that's where we do our KC-135 depot work, and if you ever get a chance to walk through there and see a 1960, KC-135 stripped to the bone with all the wiring in it. It is a miracle that now they just put it back together. They put it back together really well, and it flies around the globe and does things that no other nation can do. So, so we have about 395 or 396 KC-135s. So tomorrow, we imagine your commute into wherever you work at with 400 1960 buses from D.C. clogging the roads. We're the only organization I say on the planet that can do that. I think that's about it. One more. 
And then what we end up having to do is uh, just because of the geopolitical environment around the world, how volatile it is with places like Iran and North Korea and a uh, resurgent Russia and uh, obviously China, is we have to have regional threshold forces that can actually react in those areas and we have to bolster them at the speed of relevance with dynamic force employment. And I think that's it. And I had a picture up there, but my CAG guy's a B-52 guy, so he changed it. So anyway, so uh, thanks for your time. Again, that's just meant to spur some discussion and questions, and I look forward to uh, whatever you guys got. Okay, yes, sir. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Hi, Pat Host with Janes. Uh, the Air Force wants to buy at least 50 more MQ-9s next year. I'm wondering how that fits in with uh, peer competition. 50 more MQ-9s? At least, yeah. yeah. They want to increase the inventory by 50, so however you splice it. Liddy, is that right? Or Lee, is that right? Yeah, I believe you. That's like I said, I have the, I have the glory every day of not being the A8. So how does that is, is that accurate? We're buying 50 more or we're proposing to buy? It says 260 to 306. Okay. Uh, first of all, the caveat is if that's true, uh, that, that's fine. Uh, so our, our SOCOM partners you know, are in need of an armed overwatch. I mean, as you know, Africa is a big hunk of real estate. And we have great uh, soldiers, sailor, airmen that are on the ground there, and they need armed overwatch. And one of the discussions we've had with General Clark is exactly what's going to fill that role of armed overwatch. There's very few platforms on the planet that are better than an MQ-9 in terms of duration. Uh, if I lose one, I don't have a rescue event going on. The duration, they can stay over there without you know, needing to stop to get gas or stop to go to the bathroom or stop to going to a base is frankly unmatched. And so I'll have to get back with you to see if that's no kid in fact, but, but I'll, I'll trust you that we're gonna advocate for that. Thanks. Yeah, okay. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, General Kelly. This is uh, Abraham Mashi with Washington Examiner. It sounds like you're saying that uh, we're not ready right now for a pure adversary fight. So if, if you were uh, having to pivot quickly, uh, how would you react with the current yeah. status? Thank you. Uh, well, if you heard anybody utter, we're not ready for a pre adversary fight, you didn't hear from me. Uh, so no, we're ready for a pre adversary fight. The, the message that hopefully resonated was, this is incredibly difficult business, having the right capacity and the right capability in the current geopolitical environment uh, with things going on in Iran and North Korea and elsewhere to be able to, at the speed of relevance, uh, react to a peer fight. No, we're ready for a peer fight. Um, it will just be, t it'll be taxing. It'll be taxing to uh, the airmen, it'd be taxing to the families, it'd be taxing to the equipment. You know, right now we have all the time in the world and we have not all the money in the world. Obviously our budget is not trivial. That's a lot of coin that is going to drop, you know, regardless of how it all goes out. But at the end of the day, if a peer fight kicks up, we're going to have no time and all the money. The, the challenge is getting from where we're at now to that, to that day, which will be tough. But no, peer fight will be tough. Uh, but we're ready as we've ever been for a peer fight. Okay, yes, sir. John Turpak, Air Force Magazine. In the uh, budget documents the other day, uh, the uh, mission statement was uh, to blunt an enemy aggression. It didn't say anything about reversing or winning. Uh, wondering if anything has changed in that regard, and it also didn't say anything about more than one at a time. Uh, are we still uh, going to be capable of fighting two wars at once, or do we have to ask people to take a number and wait? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I've not, I've not heard that, you know, some of us are old enough to remember back in the days of two major theater wars. Uh, I've not heard that lexicon for years, if not multiple years. And so, as I mentioned, to one of our greatest advantages that we have is our partners and allies. At the end of the day, we're going to rely on partners and allies in any region of the globe. It doesn't matter if it's the, the Gulf nations in the Gulf or NATO in uh, Europe or if it's in you know, the Pacific with very, very high cable allies over there, whether it be the South Koreans or the Australians or the Japanese or el elsewhere. And so can we alone uh, do something as far as a hypothetical? Um, you can ask me any hypothetical you want and get whatever answer you want. But I'm here to tell you we're never going to fight alone. 
And so are we ready to engage in multiple theaters at once? Yes. Do we expect to use partners and allies? Yes. Do we have a course of action where we go alone in multiple theaters? Not that I'm aware of or I would recommend. Does that answer your question? Okay, thanks. Yes, ma'am. Teresa Hitchens with Breaking Defense. In your presentation, you said that there were some uh, lines of effort or elements of effort where we might be the near peer. Could you explain? Uh, I would I would say that uh, I would say that the adversary's cyber capabilities uh, are pretty darn capable. And the good news about cyber is I'm barely capable to power up my iPhone, so I'm not the expert on cyber. But I'll tell you what, there's some pretty capable cyber adversaries out there, and I don't think you have to look much past nefarious activity of others around the globe to say that. Now, whether we have an advantage of that, I'm confident we do but I'm not the expert on that. Um, in terms of uh, presenting, pre uh, as far as defending an area, you talk about Russian and Russian proliferated SAM systems, they're pretty darn capable and they're pretty darn mobile. Uh, and they present us with challenges every single day. You know, we tend to have to build our kill chain to get towards a mobile target. You know, that's a, tough, that's a tough thing to work through. And so it's really more of a mindset. I don't have a Excel document that tells you what lines of effort that we are, you know, five years ahead or five months behind. I'm just saying that mentally, from an approach standpoint, we, we usually come out with a better solution. We tend to think of our adversaries as peers when they truly should be thought of as peers on the battlefield. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, talking about assets and leveraging and onto the battlefield and so forth, um, do you think the Air Force is appropriately um, organized right now to leverage those capabilities and assets, or does it need to reorganize differently? Yeah, good question. The challenge with uh, reorganizations is we end up getting reorganization fatigue, uh, and, and they, they take a while to execute. So the short answer is yes. I think we're organized as well as we, as well as we can be right now to engage because, frankly, I don't know how else we would be organized unless you got a recommendation how we'd reorganize. I think, I think we're about there. Oh, are we agile enough? I'd say yes. You know, but what makes us agile uh, is uh, not so much uh, what buildings we have in org charts. It's our, our command and control, our ability to be truly a global mobility force. No one has the air mobility command that the United States Air Force has. No one has the tanker force the United States Air Force has. No one can move you know, the amount of material that our C-17 and C-5 and c 134s can. So we're agile enough to get where we need to be. As far as the other agility piece, the other part of agility is your command and control, and that's why there's so much energy and effort towards the joint all-domain command and control. You can imagine the world we live in now with everybody's iPhone and laptop and home computer and Tesla not being connected to anything. You know, we just can't imagine how that would, what that would look like. And we need to be as connected in a war fighting domain as we are used to in a civil domain. Yes, sir. Um, Michael Gordon, Wall Street Journal. Uh, uh, sir, um, you mentioned that one of the major limiting factors to improving readiness is that the Air Force is too small for all the missions it's being yes, sir. asked to carry out. But in the latest budget, it looks like the Air Force is getting smaller still and in the near term through personnel, right? They Actually, growing to space we're, command. we're growing personnel-wise. Well, 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 when you talk about space command, yeah, it's okay. a little different. Um, retirement of tankers, some B-1s, some mm -hmm. fighters. Um, so is this a conscious decision to accept more risk in the near term in the hope of husbanding resources for your great power competition, long-term programs, and if it is, what is that um, assumption based on? What is the thinking mm -hmm. and logic behind that, that you could assume more risk in the next several years? I think you just answered it, yeah. We'll end up having to take some more risk in the, in the next couple of years, but in terms of getting smaller, you know, there's, again, using the analogy of what drives on the road, you know, there's not a whole lot of 1970 vehicles, you know, jousting with us in our commute to work. 
and uh, there's not a whole lot of, uh, we can't go forward in the next 40 years relying on what made us great in the previous 40 years. And so, for example, the B1, which you mentioned, we're going to retire, I believe it's 17, so I'm going to have to check my math from the budget rollout. But frankly, what we did with the B1, the B1 was designed not to get too aviation technical, but we designed the B1 to fly low and fast and generate all its lift off of its lifting body just by doing 500 knots down low. And frankly, in the design criteria of it, it was only supposed to get up a little bit above two or 3,000 feet and swing its wings forward about the last 12 minutes of flight to get ready to land. Unfortunately, that's not how we've flown in the last 20 years. We flew just the opposite. We flew with his wings forward for the last 20 years in a heavily laden uh, right-hand or left-hand circle over uh, troops on the battlefield in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. That's a long-winded version of me saying we put stresses on that airframe, specifically the wing-loading trunnions. It was not designed to take. It was not designed to take. And if you go to that exact same Tinker Depot that I referenced and look at a trunnion, almost as high as the ceiling above me and see a crack down the titanium. This is hard, hard work. And frankly, the cost to repair some of the highest mileage aircraft exceeds their life expectancy. So we would get them back in the fight about the time we'd have to retire them for relevancy. You know, but to answer your question in terms of capacity and capability, it's, you know, we've done trades, trade-offs like this for, you know, since the inception of the Air Force, sizing and, and capability. And we can, we're the only ones, the United States Air Force is probably the only ones that has to, we have to lead in the capability realm. We have to lean on our partners and allies for some of the capacity. But will we take risk in some areas? I think we'll take some, some risk, but it's probably a bigger risk if we halt the technology growth and we halt being the leader in the penetrating force. In, in which areas? In which areas? You said we could take risk in some areas. Which areas? For, I think as you referenced, for example, one of the challenges we have in our tanker fleet is A, as I mentioned before, you know, almost 400 1960 era KC-135s that have performed miraculously since we brought them online and the well-documented challenges we're having to bring the KC-46 to full operational capability. Those two dynamics make it challenging for AMC every day. When I push fighters overseas back and forth, whether it be to Europe or to CENTCOM, every day it's a shell game of how many tankers we have to move and losing a few is not going to make that any easier. And so we're going to have to plan ahead better uh, to make sure we can get them where they need to be at the right time. It, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be tight. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yes, sir. Sir, Bill Conley. I'm a Chief Technology Officer for Mercury Systems, not with the media, um, awesome. but interested in a question. So during the Cold War, um, the U.S. government doubled R&D spending versus the entirety of commercial industry. Today it's about a three to one ratio the other direction. Um, do you see the implications of that for your day job, and is there anything happening on the commercial side that you're interested in seeing those ways of thinking come into the Air Force? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I'd say, A, if you look at the number of software coders that industry has compared to the U.S. military, it's that same in inverse proportion. Most of the challenges we have uh, that I see in our weapon systems aren't hardware-based. They're mostly software-based. Um, the other thing is, with our, as I mentioned before, the Joint All Domain Command and Control. Um, we, were, we were driving over here, getting our ride over here, joking about the difference between a Tesla and what most of us drive to work, how they all talk to each other and tell each other when there's going to be a pothole or when there's going to be a slowdown or actually when there's an accident and how to route, route around it. We, sh we are working towards our all, Joint All Domain Command and Control to having that level of connectivity and communication across multi security level domains and across multiple fighting domains. So first order of business for John Goldfein, his first priority is the Joint All Domain Command and Control, and that's where we're going to have to leverage the brilliance of industry to get us there, I think. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you, David, as being international. Uh, you stress the importance of uh, allies, coalition, air power. Uh, where do you, as the A3, need the United States to invest to keep this to make sure we can in make our air force effective. Do we need to invest more, you know, a marginal dollar in exercises, hardware preparation? Where, where is that needed to make yeah. this a real a better capability in the future? Yeah. That's a really good question. I'd say day in and day out, uh, if we build to the previous question of joint all domain command control, if we go out on this venture and we don't include our partners and allies day one 
at the table, we'll miss the boat. If we don't include industry day one, we'll miss, we'll miss this venture. If we try to, if we try to neck it down, you know, and Joan Goldfin's been unambiguous as guidance, you know, that there's a reason why there's a joint all domain command and control and not just a multi-domain command and control. Uh, is we have to have all of our services. We have to have all of our partners and allies. It has to cross cut multiple layers of security uh, or, 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 or we're not gonna be successful. Yeah, thanks for that question. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Good morning, thanks for your service. Um, Doug Greenlaw from Research Innovations, a uh, company focused on joint all domain command and control. Um, so Dr. Roper and his chief architect, Preston Dunlap, have been very emphatic about the desire to bring this commercial technology in a non-platform centric way to the force. Um, you know, for 70 years, we've been a platform-centric military, mm -hmm. and we're a platform-centric defense industrial establishment. And our Congress has been tuned to respond to, you know, uh, as we used to say, we only have factories in uh, districts that have congressmen. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to retool this entire system to produce capability fast enough to meet the, the peer threats? Yeah, good question. You know, the hardest change to make, frankly, is a culture change you know, to this. And I think, I frankly think we'll make the leap pretty quick, uh, especially if we get out of the way of the young folks who, who cut their teeth on this every day. But I'll give you an example. I'll give you a personal example, and hopefully it transfers into the bigger Air Force and the bigger Joint Force. So as an old guy who grew up flying, um, you know, F-15s, F-16s, and uh, exchange to her flying F-18s, I got used to a certain way I was going to operate flying a fighter you know, out you know, either training or in combat or red flag or something like that. And what we end up doing for 30 years, I end up trying to manage my formation and manage my intercept geometry and manage my timeline and things like that. And then I did a whopping 100 hours in F-35 and realized uh, those skills didn't exactly transfer, that I better learn how to be a really good manager of data and find out what's important on my screens and what's not. And the young folks, frankly, are almost texting me back and forth in the F-35, and I'm barely holding on. But the point is, if they, can, if they can teach me in 100 hours that the real challenge is data management and sensor management, uh, we can take this force and the other platform-centric and other services and other allies and partners, and they too, you know. As, as my wife would say, if they can make penicillin out of moldy bread, they can make a JADC2 expert out of me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Arnold, what do you got? John Horner, Raytheon. You mentioned uh, the capacity limitations of things like Patriot. And you know, when you and I went to war, typically you had a Patriot battery off the end of the runway yeah. uh, in your peer threat uh, Indo-PACOM theater. Probably not gonna have that for all the support locations for force protection and logistics. How much calories are you spending on the base defense roles and missions as we look at some of these uh, peer threats and limitations right. that our joint partners have? Yeah. Yeah, really good question, and, and short answer is a lot. Because as you know, uh, if you try to protect everything, you'll protect nothing. Um, if we, you know, we learn some of the same lessons our adversaries have, and that is we need to be mobile, uh, or else uh, what our adversaries fear is a GPS address will be somebody else's uh, GLONASS address. And so we have to move to win, and that's one of the mantras you'll see uh, the Air Force strategy. Well, if you move to win, you move to multiple locations. You have multiple locations, you have to defend them. Uh, so short answer is yes, we, sp we spend a lot of brain bites. The other thing we spend a lot of brain bites on is uh, able to fight the base. I take a hit, you know, in the center of the runway and how fast we can repair it and get back to that power projection platform actually projecting p power. Um, we're lashed up pretty close with our Army friends, you know, about what they can and can't protect with respect to THAAD, Patriot, and then close-in weapon systems. Uh, and the short answer to your question is we spend a lot of time. The defenses will have to be as agile as the force that's moving around, because if we just lock them down in place, we won't have enough. Yeah, good question. Over here, anything over here? Okay, yes, sir. So pick up on where you, on where you just were, the idea of <coughs> defending a base, protecting what you have, and if you have many bases, protecting multiple locations, does that need to be an organic capability to the Air Force, or does that need to be something that you can rely on another service for? Yes. 
to both. There are some capabilities. There are some, there are some capabilities that are going to have to be organic to the installation. Whether that be an installation be a allied installation, uh, whether that installation be a U.S. Air Force installation, whether that be, you know, whether the case would be, there's going to have to be some organic capabilities, baseline capabilities. Now, is the Air Force going to, you know, advocate to have that or some capability like that? It's just not, not going to survive contact with the budget reality. So we have to rely on the services to do what the services, you know, are, are assigned to do. Uh, it outstrips the classification in this room, what we're going to have to have. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. What else? Anything else? Yes, sir. Morning, General Kelly. Hey. LC Coffee with Ball Aerospace. Um, I read somewhere recently that uh, the Defense Department's looking at changing COCOMs to no longer be geographic. How does that impact? the Air Force, and what's driving that? Yeah, I would check the blog address. I have not heard that. We obviously have some COCOMs that aren't geographic already. We have functional uh, combat commands, but I've not heard one whisper, and I spend a whole lot of inordinate time with a coffee in front of me, the joint staff. I've never heard that. Sorry, no help there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, what else? That's also another hand. Yeah, go ahead. John Turpak. Uh, how are the roles and missions discussions going on in the uh, department these days? Are, is there going to be a, a new roles and missions debate? Because the Army seems like they're, with their long-range fires, hypersonics, mm. et cetera, getting into a lot of the missions that have traditionally been Air Force missions, uh, uh, sea, deed, uh, deep strike, uh, uh, interdiction. Uh, is the Air Force giving those up? Is it welcoming another player to uh, help with those targets? Um, but what is, what is the attitude towards roles and missions these days? Yeah, um, I wish I could help you, John. I'm not in those discussions. You know, again, like as the A3, I get to play the hand I'm dealt every day and not design the help hand that will be dealt to the A3 in eight years, but I've not heard one discussion on roles and missions review, like a revisit of Key West. Is that what you're getting at? Yes. Yeah, I've not heard that, you know, in any, any, any venue. Yeah. Yes, sir. With, with cuts to uh, AFRICOM, uh, how would the Air Force... Cuts to where? Cuts to Africa Command and to our support of allies in, in the fight against terrorism in the Sahel and West Africa. How can the Air Force uh, assist um, with their capacity where other resources are, are drawn back yeah. in Africa? Did we codify a cut to AFRICOM that I'm not aware of? Uh, that's, my understanding is that we're going to scale back what resources are going to be uh, okay. to that region. Okay. My understanding is they're doing a review, and so I would not want to... Uh, clarify or, or substantiate a cut to anywhere that hasn't happened yet. But to answer your question of how the Air Force supports big geography spots like Africa, uh, frankly, we can, we can be places at a speed uh, with the capability that, you know, again, no one else can be at. We can put a, a MQ-9, as we referenced earlier, 20 hours over a force, and we don't need a base in that smaller country, or the case may be, and not put aviators at risk or have to drive over land or create a port. Uh, if there is cuts to anywhere in the globe, uh, then the challenge to our Air Force is usually the Air Force is more in demand. You know, when there's, when there's cuts to ports, when there's cuts to troops on the ground, when there's cuts to our great State Department folks doing their things, usually the air power is the last thing people want to give up. But I'm not aware of any codified cuts to any combatant command at this time. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, sir, um, from General Holmes last fall, I heard a Spectrum Warfare Wing is getting stood up. Yeah. Um, last time I heard it'll be established sometime this summer. How are you thinking about including that into your force structure going forward? Yeah, this, the, uh, first of all, I, uh, I don't have my finger on the pulse of the Spectrum Warfare Wing, but I'm a big fan of it, uh, mainly because uh, the amount the, in the cyber realm and the electromagnetic spectrum uh, in a peer fight uh, will be the most congested, contested, you know, domain out there. It, some people don't refer to electromagnetic as a, as a domain. That's okay. They're probably smarter than me. But that will be the most contested, congested fight we have. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the quote of uh, if we lose in space, we'll lose the war and we'll lose it quick. 
if we get dominated in the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, it'll be a tough day, week, month, be a tough fight. So to that end, um, big fan of the spectrum warfare wing. I apologize, Joe Holmes is the expert of exactly where, when, flag, location, uh, organizational structures it'll have. But 16th Air Force is off and running, and my gut feel is I'm very confident it'll fall under 16th Air Force. I just am not up to date on exactly the details of it. Yeah, yes, sir. Hi, sir. Vagam Maradian with Defense and Aerospace Report. Good to see you again. Um, U.S. Air Force has taken for granted stealth uh, and the ability to project air power, at least, uh, with minimizing the risk to itself. If you look at everything from quantum sensing to a whole bunch mm -hmm. of investments that allies are making, how are you gauging the advantage and the longevity of that advantage and all of the things that we have to do in order to be able to preserve, fight, and succeed in an environment that's going to become a lot more contested, even with F-35, B-21, mm -hmm. and NGAT? You say, when you say take for granted, you mean we take for granted that it's... It's we, it's, a, it's a strategic advantage we've enjoyed since the yes. late 1970s. Mm -hmm. And that gap looks like it's eroding for a whole series of, of reasons. How do you regard the space? And what are the things that the U.S. Air Force has to do yeah. in its fundamentally changing its thinking? Because we can now operate with a degree of impunity that you know, we might not be able to enjoy, say, five, ten years from now. You know, good question. Really, the answer to that, I would lean on the previous question, is the electromagnetic spectrum. Frankly, the reason, you know, why our service went down the road of, you know, F-117 and beyond was to be able to operate and, frankly, dominate in the electromagnetic spectrum in that particular way. And so that's why the, the, the network warfare wing, you know, uh, is even more important. It is, it's not a, it's kind of a blind, blinding flash the obvious the quantum computing and processing power is getting more powerful every day, and so we just have to have a step ahead of it. But I would not decree uh, stealth as a uh, as an as an attribute that we want to give up anytime soon. We just have to make sure we don't operate our LO as if it's NO. You know, if we operate our low observable as if it's not observable, you know, that's our fault, and we don't trust me. We don't look at it that way. Sir, uh, as we get uh, close to closing out, Orville Wright uh, AFA, uh, for AFA at Mitchell, uh, our mission is obviously to support a dominant Air Force and our airmen and families. Uh, do you have a message uh, on this video that's going to go worldwide for your airmen and your families uh, that are deployed uh, both overseas and certainly supporting the fight from all over the world? Yeah, well, thanks. Oh, first of all, thanks everybody's time and uh, questions. I appreciate the discussion and debate um, on these topics are important. But uh, again, as reference to the theme of the chat that we had, you know, a lot of folks uh, believe, wake up believing that you know, our Air Force that went to war in 1990 is pretty much the exact same force uh, that we have today. It's, it's not. You know, in a lot of ways, it's better that I didn't highlight. You know, uh, besides better weapon systems, uh, better cyber capability, better space capability, uh, better airmen. Um, it's a phenomenal force and they do, they do miracles every day around the globe. Uh, the challenge we have now is, you know, since 9-11, since we are now have airmen that have been in the Air Force going on 19 years who will retire from the U.S. military have never known peace. And that means their families have never known peace, which means their families have never known, you know, the nuclear family having, being home every Thanksgiving and Christmas like many of us grew up in. And so that's why I mentioned early on, our families are our least paid members of this Air Force team. And so, uh, first of all, I just say a word of thanks, not only being here, but thanks for supporting them, you know, unwaveringly as they go forward to our nation's bidding. You know, it also is not a surprise to this crowd. We have a fairly red hot economy. And so when we have our airmen, it doesn't matter if they're a GS airman or a E3 airman or a 09 airman, and we push them to the point where they have to choose between serving their nation and serving their family, we put them in a tough spot, you know, and so it's our job, it's my job uh, to give best military advice uh, to all the decision makers and keep them in my mind, so I just ask you to keep our great airmen and their families in your mind. So thank you very much. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you, General. That was uh, outstanding, and we have a gift awesome. for you. Uh, 
The, this is a book called To Fly and Fight. It's uh, Memoirs of a Triple Ace, C.E. Bud Anderson. And I tell you, uh, and it's signed by Bud. Great. But uh, it, it, thinking about the hundreds of aircraft fights he, had, he was involved in in the Old Crow, uh, it makes the DCAOR seem not so bad. So read this at night when you're Great. really under <laughs> a lot of pressure. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Thank you so Appreciate much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks. 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 I have one last announcement before we dismiss. Uh, don't forget, a couple weeks from now, we've got the Air Warfare Symposium down in Orlando, uh, bigger and better than ever. The theme of that is multi-domain operations uh, uh, from vision to reality. Uh, both the Secretary of the Air Force and the Chief of the Air Force will be there. Uh, once again, it's, it's bigger and better than ever, but I, if I were you and you haven't signed up, Orlando's a great place, by the way. Please do so, because it's uh, filling fast. Any other comments on that? Thanks. Okay, great. Have a great Mitchell hour day. We'll see you later.